Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Institute for the Advancement of Women's Health September Lunch and Learn. My name is Cheryl Thompson, and I am one of the co-directors of IAWH. Every month, we host at least one expert in the field of public health, women's health, heart health, to present, teach, and challenge us to improve our health literacy and give us guidance to apply what we learn here to improve our health outcomes. We are so very fortunate to have Dr. Patricia Davidson as our speaker, presenter, and teacher today. Some of you already know Dr. Davidson, but some do not. So I will properly introduce her to everyone. This is, part, this is the part where everybody gets antsy and says, just come on with the speaker, but you will want to hear about Dr. Davidson's amazing career. <laughs> Dr. Davidson is a medical internist and cardiologist who has a private practice in Washington, DC. She attended the University of Michigan where she received a degree in psychology. She went on to receive a master's degree in chemistry from Atlanta University. She graduated as the third woman of color in 100 years from the University of Louisville Medical School. She is a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Davidson served on the faculty of the University of Maryland Medical School as an assistant professor in the Division of Hypertension and Cardiology. She was an instructor of medicine at the Howard University Medical School, and she served as a master faculty member for women and heart disease for the American Medical Women's Association. Dr. Davidson is a very popular speaker among national and local organizations like this one on the topic of her greatest passion, heart disease in women, African Americans, and other ethnic populations. She aided the Honorable Congresswoman Maxine Waters in the preparation of her amendment to the Women's Health Research and Prevention Act. Dr. Davidson's medical practice focuses on preventive cardiology, including weight reduction, smoking cessation, hypertension detection and control, cholesterol lowering, and exercise. She encourages a positive change in lifestyle to embody health and longevity. Welcome, Dr. Davidson. Thank you and good morning or good afternoon. And, um, and this is a wonderful organization. And um, I know you wanted a heavy focus on hypertension, but hypertension is not isolated. And I wanted to make sure everybody understood the connection of how we become hypertensive and all of the other many diseases that are associated with hypertension. So it is not an isolated uh, um, disease. And, and it's actually it's a risk factor. And so I want, I want to go through the whole process because it is part of heart disease and so and, and also of cerebrovascular disease too, the brain. So you, if you understand one risk factor, you have to understand all the other risk factors because rarely does one person have just one risk factor. So I'm, I try to put all that together and um, I've included some, some slides specifically on drugs because you all were interested in, in hypertensive medicine. And I will answer all of the questions that you already gave me. Um, and, and we can go in greater depth in, um, in all of these um, the hypertensive medications that, and once I'm finished, so. Hmm. How come I can't advance my slide? Can you click on it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay. Now Great. the disease that you all need to understand is called atherosclerosis. Some people call it arterial sclerosis. And that is the hardening of the arteries and that is the primary killer of all Americans 
all ethnic groups and all genders. And now of course, that doesn't include all the high rate and homicide we now have in COVID, but um, prior to all of that, it was atherosclerosis. Now, now these are the coronary arteries. These are the coronary arteries. arteries. Why do I have this? And these are two tiny arteries which are the size of a pencil tip. And that's what your artery looks like. And it has a muscle inside. And inside of that, we have all kinds of hormones and enzymes that are good and bad that cause plaque to form. So when you're born, your artery is supposed to look like this. And over time, it begins to build up this plaque, which eventually becomes, uh, it's, it's cholesterol, but it has a whole lot of other debris in it and eventually becomes hardened with calcium. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what your artery is supposed to look like when you're born. And then as time goes on, depending upon the lifestyle your parents have led you to live, your plaque begins to form. And then And then the, the plaque ruptures because of something that may happen in which the artery actually collapses on itself because it is a muscle at this very point where there's cholesterol plaque and then blood ends up filling up this particular area uh, of the artery. If it totally closes off the artery, you end up with a heart attack and a stroke. If it partially closes, as you see here, good grief, what is all this going on? Okay, I don't know how all this keeps coming in. I've never had that. If it partially closes it, then we have something called a TIA, transient ischemic attack on the brain, or an acute coronary syndrome on the heart. And that's when people tell you that it is a small heart attack um, because the artery wasn't totally closed and you didn't get damage to the muscle. What we have to worry about though, is that we don't have to have significantly clogged arteries. We can have just partially clogged arteries in which we just have a little bit of plaque here. And as a result, we now know that this is the plaque that's most likely to rupture because it is still soft thin fibrous cap, and it doesn't have the calcium on. So even though you have totally normal heart tests, you can still have a heart attack because if you see this artery here, it's nice and big and wide. So if you did a stress test, you would end up having a normal stress test. If we put dye in the artery from an arteriogram, it would be wide open and we wouldn't be able to do anything to it. But it doesn't mean that you can't have a heart attack because you still have some plaque there. So a heart attack is a bruise on the muscle wall. It's called an MI or myocardial infarction and the coronary artery is totally clogged. Now that's different from congestive heart failure. Now, now this is bar, um, keep you all from seeing the, the title on my slides. You, you all can see the title on the slides? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, and that is the failure of the heart to efficiently pump blood to the organs and back again. And uncontrolled blood pressure is the major cause in African-Americans and coronary artery disease is the major cause in the majority of the population. So this is why it is all tied together. So if you have uncontrolled blood pressure for several decades, you are gonna end up with congestive heart failure in which, and that is when your body fills up with fluid, um, you have swollen legs, swollen abdomen, um, uh, you, you're, you can't breathe because you have fluid in your lungs. And, and, and that is a person who is usually hypertensive if they're African-American for a long period of time in which the heart can't relax anymore. So you have two kinds of heart failure. One, which the heart can't relax properly because it's thick from uncontrolled blood pressure or else it, it comes from a, a, having had a heart attack and damaged muscle where the heart can't contract. And so that's why the, all of this is related to one another. And so who actually ends up with abnormal arteries? So if you eat animals every day, you're not gonna have normal arteries. If your body mass index is over 25, then, and you're overweight, you're not gonna have normal arteries. 
If your LDL bad cholesterol is over 100, you're not going to have normal arteries. If your systolic blood pressure is over 120, you're not going to have normal arteries. If your fasting blood sugar is over 100, you won't have normal arteries. If you don't exercise and get the benefit of beneficial hormones like endorphins, you're not going to have normal arteries. If you smoke, nicotine is the worst of all of our um, all of our risk factors, and that destroys the artery wall terribly and forms plaque faster than any other risk factor. Um, if you have an inflammatory process such as poor oral hygiene, arthritis, chronic infections like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and pelvic inflammatory diseases and all this, then that, that releases unhealthy hormones and enzymes that also damage the heart, the um, arteries to the, to the um, heart and also to the brain. So all of these are risk factors and they are all interrelated. So if you have any of these risk factors and if you have more than one at one time, you will not have normal arteries. So your goal in life is to get rid of all of your risk factors because just getting rid of one is not good enough. You have to get rid of all of your risk factors in order for you to have normal arteries so you don't end up with a heart attack and stroke. And so ultimately that is what you want to have is no heart attack and stroke. Now, COVID, people wanna know about what happens to the heart in COVID. Well, we have heart attacks that are due to blood clot in the coronary artery. And we also have people developing congestive heart failure and their muscle becomes weak and we call that a cardiomyopathy. And we have blood clots in the legs um, that travel to the lungs. And we also end up with abnormal heart rhythms such as atrial fibrillation. So all of that we now know happens with COVID. So this is, that's not, that is one reason why you wanna protect yourself from that. Now let's look at the death rates. <clears throat> it's all the same disease, but the death rates are different. African-American women have the highest death rate from heart disease, white women next. And then you see Latino and, a and Native American women. Those numbers are not accurate because we don't know when a person is Latino and Native American most times, so they are being underreported. Asian women, those numbers are real. They have the lowest of all diseases in this country. And that's primarily because they stay thin and they don't smoke. So there are three things that one can do if they wanna prevent the majority over 80% of the diseases that we die from is to stay thin, not smoke and walk. And if you do those three things, you are highly unlikely to die from any of the acquired diseases. And then you just have to worry about the cancers which we don't control from our bad environment and a Mack truck hitting you or, or homicides. So, um, so basically 80, over 80% 80 of our diseases are prevented by doing those three things. And when we look at the male population, we see that white men have the lowest, um, heart, uh, lowest heart disease death rate because they are the ones who we prevent disease and we give all of our preventative medicine to and we do all of our education and we do all our studies on. Asian men, don't have that same benefit because they are heavy smokers. So they lose the benefit that Asian women have. And then the rest of the, the, the patients, uh, the rest of the people of color have the highest death rate from heart disease. Now let's talk individually about each risk factor. We'll start with hypertension. <clears throat> now there's lots of cal classifications, but there's only one thing you need to remember is that normal blood pressure is under 120 and under eight. That's all you need to remember. You don't need to remember about stage one and two and all that. Just remember that you need to be under 120 and under 80. And we have the SPRINT trial, which is just one of hundreds of trials, but that is the most recently redone trial because we, we do these trials all the time. And the NIH looked at the difference between 120 versus 140 systolic blood pressure. If you were 120 or less, you had a one third reduction in heart attack, stroke and heart failure and a 25% reduction in death. So this is extremely important for you to understand how all of this is interrelated. So you must be 120 in order to prevent the damage to your arteries and your heart muscle, which leads to the heart failure, the heart attacks and the stroke. And every pound you lose is worth two millimeters of mercury. So if you lose five pounds, your blood pressure is going to drop 10 millimeters of mercury and vice versa. If you gain five pounds, your blood pressure is going to go up 10 millimeters of mercury. So weight is the primary driver of, of your hypertension. 
And then you've all probably heard about the DASH diet that the NIH also studied. And that just said that a diet rich in fruit, vegetables, low fat dairy, and low salt can substantially reduce blood pressure. And salt is for snow and sore throats. If you're using salt for any other reason, you will become hypertensive and you also will lead your children and your family to hypertension. So salt belongs in the medicine cabinet when you have a sore throat and out in the garage for your next snowstorm. And there are foods that help lower blood pressure. Now this is not when you have really high blood pressure, but help prevent or maybe add a few extra points. Um, nitrate rich foods like beets, arugula, spinach, celery, and parsley are beneficial. High potassium foods like beans, the navy black, soya, pinto, and lima are high in potassium, that's beneficial. Polyphenols like blueberries, nuts, green tea, extra virgin olive oil, and legumes. Hibiscus tea is very good. Um, and I tell patients they can drink as much hibiscus tea as they want, provided they're not adding sugar to it. Um, and that will help lower some blood pressure. And, and flax seed. So all of these are foods that may help. They're not going to be used in place of hypertension medicine if you need hypertension medicine, but they will be helpful um, in terms of adding to um, your diet. And so let's talk a little bit about some of, of the drugs. Um, one of them is the ACE inhibitor class. And uh, one of the big side effects is a dry cough, very common and a life-threatening angioedema, sorry, I spelled threatening wrong, um, in which your throat and your face and everything and your lips swell up. And these side effects are more common in persons of Asian and African descent. So I do not use ACE inhibitors in my population uh, for this reason, because this particular side effect, both the cough and the angioedema can happen at any point in time. It can happen 10 years later, 20 years later. And so that is not my preference in terms of blood pressure therapy. Now, I prefer to use something called an ARB or an angiotensin receptor blocker. And they are very similar in terms of how they help the, um, the blood pressure lower because they relax the, the, uh, the, blood, the blood vessels by attacking a hormone called angiotensin II, which constricts the arteries and this relaxes the arteries. And this particular class of drugs has the lowest side effect profile. Frequently, you have to add a diuretic to be effective in something called low renin hypertension. And renin is a hormone in your kidneys, which is low in most people who have hypertension, people of African descent, people who are overweight, people who are older, and people who are diabetic. So that represents the majority of patients who have hypertension, except for young, thin, white people. Um, they will have low renin levels. And so in order to get that renin level up, a diuretic will raise that renin level and will allow all of the other blood pressure medicines to work better, especially if it's an angiotensin receptor blocker or an ACE inhibitor. So if, if you start one of these drugs and your blood pressure is not controlled, then you just add the diuretic and usually the diuretic is combined with the drug. So you've all seen, you know, Losartan, HCT, Valsartan, HCT, all of that, the HCT, the hydrochlorothiazide is a diuretic added to the angiotensin receptor blocker, which makes it more effective. And that's your lowest side effect profile drug. Calcium channel blockers are gonna be your strongest drug. They relax the blood vessels, and they, but they can also cause swelling in the legs because while they are relaxing the blood vessels that cause a lowering of the, of the um, hypertension, um, they also relax the blood vessels in all of your limbs, including your legs. Um, and they're the most powerful class. Um, the most, um, most commonly used one is amlodipine, um, also called Norvast, or nifedipine called um, Procardia, which is less often used than the Norvast. Norvast is probably the number one drug worldwide. And there's two other calcium channel blockers, diltiazem and rapamil, which are not used um, as much because they are less effective. Also, the, um, the amlodipine and the uh, nifedipine increase the heart rate. So if a person is having a problem with the heart pounding, because um, it flushes blood to the heart. So some people feel a pounding and some people may also have an increased heart rate. So um, you may have to lower the dosage or use it in combination with something called a beta blocker. And they block receptors in the heart, the blood vessels in the lungs, which then lower the blood pressure. And they used to be the first class of drugs that we use for hypertension. We no longer use that class for one thing. They are a weaker class 
and also they have a higher side effect profile, causing impotence in men. Also, they can slow the heart rate down too much in older people. I mean, that's one of the side effects. But it is very good to be used with a drug that may be increasing the heart rate, like the amlodipine. And it is necessary if congestive heart failure um, rates exist, because um, um, that is one of the drugs that is shown to improve the heart muscle. So if a person has congestive heart failure, they usually need to be on a beta blocker. Diuretics, as I said, are necessary for low renin hypertension. And um, the lowest dosage is usually effective. So I see a lot of people coming to me on very high dosages. Well, all that does is end up causing you to lo lower your potassium, increase your uric acid, which causes gout, and also causes you to stay in the bathroom too much. So it's usually the lowest dosage is all you usually need to raise the renin level, and that's usually enough. Now, insulin resistance is one of the big issues that we have. When you gain weight, especially when you reach menopause, around the abdomen, you end up with insulin resistance. And that comes from the sedentary lifestyle and increasing, you know, doing too many carbs and things like that. And you end up with a lot of inflammatory process going on in the body. And you also end up impacting the pancreas, the uh, beta cells in the pancreas. And we call that insulin resistance. Now, metabolic syndrome, which is a fancy term, for what some people call pre-diabetes. And anytime somebody says you are pre-something, it doesn't mean you don't have the disease. It just means that we don't need to treat it at this point in time with drugs because you're capable of turning it around with diet. So if somebody says you're pre-hypertensive or pre-diabetic, it just means that it is low enough to be able to lose some weight or do some dietary changes to lower your blood pressure or your, or your sugar without medication. It does not mean that the destruction is not taking place in the heart and the artery wall. So it'll be very, it's sort of like being in the first trimester of pregnancy and you know how that turns out. So, um, so don't think that because you, somebody told you you were pre, you don't have anything going on. And you, you know that you have metabolic syndrome if your waist size is over 31.5, if you're a woman of color, 35, if you're European. Now we have this myth that we are big boned and that we're supposed to be heavier than everybody else. Well, this data is showing you that you have to be thinner than everybody else because you will develop diabetes at a lower, um, at, at a, at a lower waist size and weight than the Caucasian population. So we have to be thinner than everybody else. And for men of color, they need to be 37 inches or else they'll develop diabetes. Your blood, fasting blood sugar should be, if it's over 100, you're considered metabolic syndrome. And if you have a high cholesterol or blood pressure, you're considered metabolic syndrome. So again, all of this is interrelated with one another, all of these risk factors. And diabetics cannot have normal arteries. That is very important. And we call this a coronary artery disease equivalent. If you have an elevated sugar, you do not have normal arteries. And so, and so most diabetics are going to die from heart attacks and stroke because their arteries are not normal. And that's why most diabetics are supposed to be on cholesterol medicine, no matter what their cholesterol levels are, because the sugar is so detrimental to the artery that they should be protecting it um, in order to prevent a heart attack and a stroke. And so when you are diabetic, we, we have a whole lot of issues. I'll go into, I can go into the question and answer period about what your LDL bad cholesterol should be. Um, ideally, you want to be under 70 because we have data showing that you can reverse plaque when your LDL goes under 70. We say that the general population could be under 100, but ideal is under 70. And if you actually have heart disease, or if you have cholesterol anywhere in your body, or if you had a stroke, um, or if any tests that you've had show that you have cholesterol plaque somewhere, or if you are diabetic, which is, a, as I said, a heart disease um, equivalent, then you bet your ideal blood, um, um, cholesterol should be under 70. And body mass index is critical. If your body mass index is over 25, and that's, that's the calculation you see here, unfortunately, we have to use a conversion chart because, and I think, I think you were given all conversion charts um, because everybody else in the world uses the metric system with kilograms over, or metric um, over meter squared. So you have to put your, um, your weight over your height and you'll get your body mass index. And if you're over 25, you basically are going to end up dying from your weight. So that's very, very, very important. If your body mass index is over 25, you will be dying from your weight because you are going to become diabetic. You're going to have more heart disease, more stroke, 
more atrial fibrillation, which is directly related to your weight, more hypertension, and all of those risk factors come, come into play, and also more cancer, because that we also know that weight is associated with most cancers. So, um, so weight is critical. So what happens when we are overweight? We have an increase in stroke, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, gallbladder disease, arthritis, gout, deep vein thrombosis, venous stasis, cancer of the breast, colon, uterus, pancreas, kidney, prostate, sleep apnea, fatty liver, reproductive abnormalities like polycystic ovarian disease, infertility, abnormal menses. And when it relates to structural changes in the heart, we have an increase in the left atrium, which then increases the atrial fibrillation because it comes from the upper chamber. And we also have an increase in the left ventricle, the thickness of the left ventricle, the lower chamber, which then causes us to have, have more congestive heart failure. So these are all the structural changes that take place in the heart. And so it's, see how it's interrelated just by being hypertensive, all of these kinds of things end up happening. And fat is, metabolically, is a metabol metabolically active tissue that attacks every organ in your body. So it is not about body shaming. It's not about feeling good about your body. It's about the reality, the fact that fat is a tissue that is just like the other tissues in the body, except this tissue is deadly. And who is overweight in this country? African-American women, 68%, and Mexican-Americans, 69%. So you can see that Latino women, especially if they're from Mexico, will not have a lower, um, a low um, heart disease rate. Asian-American women, 10%, and then you can see why they have the lowest rate of all diseases, and white women, nearly 50%. And this is what we have to watch out for, the full figure revolution, if you've got it flaunted. So we have a whole movement now about body shaming and, and um, being proud of who you are. And we have people dancing around on stage at 300 pounds and all that. But we have to re realize that, that the only thing we are flaunting right now is the highest rate of heart disease um, worldwide. Prevention, you can turn back the disease. If you walk 30 minutes a day, you have a 50% reduction in heart attack, stroke, and cancer as well. So whatever you do for preventing heart attack and stroke, you're also preventing cancer. The more you walk, the lower your, your, um, your risk of heart disease is. And nutrition, you are what you eat. So let's go over this again. We have old data that suggested that your LDL cholesterol could be under 130 and under 160. So that was years ago. You still see some older lab um, tests showing that as a normal on the test. Um, that's because that is the data that we had with some of the weaker cholesterol drugs. So every time a stronger cholesterol drug came out, and those are all called statins, we found out that patients had less heart attacks and stroke and live longer. And so when we got to 130, because our, our, our weakest drug, pravastatin, could only get us to 130 and a little bit lower, there was no difference between 100 and 130. So that's where we got the 130 from. Um, then uh, another drug came along, Lipitor, Torvastatin, and we got to under 100 and we did better. And then Crestar, Resuvastatin came along, got to under 70 and showed a trend for reversal of the plaque. So nobody should be over 100. Ideally, you should be under 70 because your goal is to not form plaque at all. And where does cholesterol come from? I still find when I ask this question to my patients, most of them really don't know. And um, it comes from animals. That's the only place you can get cholesterol. And every living cell is composed of cholesterol. You are an animal, you're composed of cholesterol and your liver metabolizes your cholesterol. Now, when your cholesterol is over hundred, this means that your liver is on strike. It cannot take in any more, any more cholesterol. So it just floats through your artery wall and forms plaque. So that you know that if you have elevated cholesterol, you're taking in too much animals. Now, there is also a percentage of patients in the population who can have a genetic defect in your liver and you, you don't have enough enzymes to metabolize your cholesterol. And no matter, even if you're a vegan, you will never get your cholesterol down. And so that person has to be on medication. And, um, and so you know that because their LDL is usually above 150. And when you get up over 150, it's usually genetic. And these are the drugs that you hear about all on the internet because there's a whole anti-statin campaign going on on the internet. 
The reason statins, and the reason they're called statins is because the last syllable of the generic name is statin. Resuvastatin, atorvastatin, pravastatin, lovastatin. And so they're called statins as a group. And this is why the statins are so life-saving because they do all these fancy things. They get rid of all these bad things that you see here, um, including inflammation, and, um, and they lower the LDL. So it's more than just lowering the LDL. They are actually doing things chemically within the artery wall and reducing that plaque. And that's why they end up being so life-saving. And what kind of protein can you eat? Um, you don't only have to eat um, animal protein, beans, especially the, the soya bean, which is tofu, which is, which is a complete protein can also be used. Um, of course, animal proteins like dairy and meat, and, um, and you pick the lowest cholesterol animal, which would be fish and poultry without the skin. So look upon it as the animals that fly and the animals that swim have, have, are the simplest animals. Therefore, they have the lowest number of cells and therefore they have the lowest amount of cholesterol. The animals that walk on land and walk on the bottom of the ocean are the animals that are highest in cholesterol. So you wanna focus on low cholesterol animals and you cannot eat an animal every time you eat and have arteries free of cholesterol. And so you also need to color code your food. Green vegetables are lowest in sugar, highest in nutrients, red, yellow, and orange food, high in sugar, but high in nutrients and white food is refined, high in sugar and low in nutrients. So you really shouldn't be eating anything white because it's only basically sugar. So, so white rice is really a bowl of sugar and your pasta and all that made from white flour and your white bread, all of that is nothing but sugar. And so, um, so your goal is, is to try to get, if you're overweight or diabetic or, or pre-diabetic, your goal is to get rid of as many carbohydrates as possible. So you would focus mostly on the green carbohydrates. Um, if something has sweet in front of its name, you know that it's high in sugar. Fruit is high in sugar. So if you have a problem with sugar or a problem with weight, then you can't have huge amounts of those particular foods that have to be used in extreme moderation. So you focus heavily on all your green vegetables along with your protein. Protein is not what gives you weight. It may drive up your cholesterol, but it's not gonna drive up your weight. It's, the, it's your carbohydrates that drive up your weight because carbohydrates are the sugar source that athletes need to run their marathons and fight their fights and play in Wimbledon and all of that. If you're not an athlete, you cannot eat all that carbohydrate. Food industry has convinced you to eat all that carbohydrate because it's cheap and it has longer shelf life. So you need to recognize that everything you eat comes from the food industry trying to convince you that you need to eat that. And so, and our minds have, have just, we, we think our grandmother did it, but no, the food industry ended up giving us most of what we end up eating and all the things that we do for whatever ever activity that we have. So we associate food with every single activity in this country, going to the movies, um, going to Super Bowl, um, everything that we do, we have a food associated, even things like Easter where ham is associated and Christ was raised as a Jew. So we have, that, that did not come, that, that didn't come from your grandmother, that came from the food industry. So these are the things that you have to recognize. So focus more on green food, and low cholesterol protein or no cholesterol protein. And if you wanna know things that reduce your risk of heart disease, nuts, five or more servings a week gives a 14% lower cardiovascular risk and 20% lower risk of coronary heart disease. Red meat increases your risk of all cause mortality from cancer to heart disease. And fried potatoes, potato chips, hash browns, two to three times a week will also increase your mortality. And what are, how do you present with heart disease? This is very important. Chest pain is the usual way, chest discomfort. You can have back pain, women have more than that, more often than men do. Dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, very common in the um, female population. Nausea and fatigue, I don't think you can see that on the chart, but fatigue. Fatigue is a very important symptom because most women don't exercise to the point where they can get chest pain, and shortness of breath. So it's fatigue that they have. So if you, are, if you have a lot of risk factors and you have a whole lot of fatigue, meaning that you don't feel like shopping anymore, you're kind of out of sorts, you don't feel like going to church anymore, um, you probably have clogged arteries. And so all of these are, are, are symptoms that you're supposed to, your doctor is supposed to pay attention to. And we've been doing for the last couple of decades, all this education on, on gender differences and symptoms. So shortness of breath and fatigue are significant heart symptoms until proven otherwise. 
And you can be sure that there is a significant racial and gender referral bias. Um, so that you are, you are as an African-American woman, are least likely to be referred for these studies like, like an angiogram and an angioplasty. So an angiogram is when you actually thread a catheter through the leg or the arm into the artery and shoot die down, meaning gram being picture. Angioplasty would actually go down into the artery and, and open up a balloon and crack open the cholesterol plaque and put a little um, wire mesh in there. And I said the word crack. So once you crack open that and it spreads up and down your artery wall, you have to keep it open with lots and lots of medicine. So that's not a panacea. Your goal is not to do that if you don't have to. And if you have, and so um, who gets the angioplasty? You must be symptomatic. This is very, very critical. We used to open up everybody's artery. We no longer do that. The artery has to be proven to be 70% closed. You must have symptoms because there, and you have to have proof. They have to actually go down into the artery and prove it's 70% closed. And we know, the reason for that is because angioplasties do not prevent heart attacks or death. Neither does open heart surgery. And so we know that we can open up those arteries with, with medication by getting your LDL to under 70, getting your sugar down and your blood pressure down. And that's why we don't go and open up every artery that we see like we used to years ago. So it's very important when somebody says that you need an angioplasty, you need to be symptomatic because it's symptoms that you're gonna be relieving, not heart attacks and strokes. And they have to prove that your artery is significantly clogged. Because after you actually have it open, you have to be on two blood thinners, you have to be on a statin, you have to be on all of that or your artery is gonna close up again. And if you have too many arteries clogged, you need open heart surgery. And in this case, you're using the arteries from the chest wall called mammary arteries, or you're using a vein from the leg, which is not as successful and closes up a lot easier. And again, you have to be on the blood thinners, you have to be on the, uh, which are called antiplatelet drugs like aspirin, um, and you have to be on, um, on statins in order to lower that cholesterol. So in conclusion, you are looking at a lethal weapon, and the fact is that Americans die by the fork many more than any other weapon, and that's because they fill it up with more, with, that's because they use it irresponsibly and they fill it up with high fat, high cholesterol foods, foods that load up your arteries with cholesterol and plaque. And so the next time you pick up a fork, make sure that you use it for self-defense and not self-destruction. Questions? <clears throat> And if you want me to start with the questions that you said were already, I can go through them quickly as well. Yeah, yeah I sent you a list Somebody of them. Yes, yeah, someone asked, is chronic kidney disease comes from uncontrolled hypertension? Most definitely. Um, diabetes is the number one cause. Diabetes and drug, drug, drug use are the number one cause of people being on dialysis, but hypertension is up there with that. So if your blood pressure and your sugar stay uncontrolled, you will destroy your kidneys very easily. Yes, you can reverse that so that if you control your sugar and your blood pressure, then you can usually keep it at bay and might even improve. And atrial fibrillation is directly related to hypertension and directly related to your weight. We now know that, that the more overweight people will end up being, being, have atrial fibrillation. So you put the two risk factors together, you most likely will end up with atrial fibrillation, which is the number one arrhythmia, which is an abnormal heart rhythm worldwide. And someone said, is there a difference between high blood pressure and hypertension? No, that's the same. And you can, um, <clears throat> and can you recommend studies and means for reducing diastolic pressures without medicine? Well, we talked about that. Um, if your diastolic is high and your systolic is, is, is not, uh, work on weight loss, lots of exercise, just walking. Um, you can do things like hibiscus tea and, and you know, foods that help lower that. Um, if you can't get it down and it's extremely high, which is rare, because it's usually systolic hypertension that we have. Younger people may have diastolic, um, but, it's, but it's, our, it's usually systolic because our arteries are getting stiff as we age. <clears throat> Can you recommend study? No, I'm interested in injectable medicines in cardiology. Well, I'm assuming you're talking about the medicines that are being used for diabetes, like Trulicity and Ozempic, which are drugs that are um, protect the heart. Um, and so they're, they're very heart protective or else you're, and you're also talking about the cholesterol medicines now um, that are, are not given every day, but, but are given once a month or every two weeks. 
and, um, and they significantly lower your cholesterol. So you, only can, you would only use those cholesterol medicines if you cannot tolerate a statin. And it is extremely hard to get because they cost thousands of dollars and we have to go through prior authorization and prove that you've had an event or have significant disease before your insurance company will even cover it. In terms of the injectables for diabetes, um, they are approved for weight loss, but again, the insurance companies aren't covering it. So hopefully in the future, they are the, they are the safest drugs that we have for weight loss. And hopefully uh, we will be able to use those drugs because they, because they do stop working when your sugar gets low. So you can still use it in a, in a non-diabetic, but hopefully in the future, we will be able to use the injectables for, uh, for weight loss because it costs a significant amount of weight loss and will be life-saving if the insurance companies will cover it. And how long does it take for hypertension to damage organs? Well, that varies. Um, if you're on medicine, hypertension will not damage your organs. If you're not on medicine, it most definitely will damage your organs. So, um, and we don't have a time span. Obviously some people can, can get away with it for long periods of time and others cannot. Um, and I think, well, I may let you ask, there were a lot of questions about, um, or I should say, I, I was given a list of the medicines that you're on. I see that a lot of people are on the angiotensin receptor blockers, which will be the telmosartan, losartan, and they end in sartan, by the way, and valsartan. Um, so that's what I end up using first on my patients because they have the lowest side effect profile. Um, a number of people are on hydrochlorothiazide with the ARB and some are on hydrochlorothiazide by itself. And, um, and one person is on amlodipine with valsartan and hydrochlorothiazide all in one. Now, they, many of these drugs come in combination, but most insurance companies won't cover them anymore. And then somebody said here that they're also on valsartan and lisinopril. And you cannot use an ACE inhibitor and an ARB together. They're too similar in, um, in their uh, characteristics, so they can't be used together. So, um, um, but that combination of the calcium channel blocker, the ARB and the, and, and the hydrochlorothiazide um, is usually what I end up using and I can get 90% of my patients controlled. Um, I don't like to use the high hydrochlorothiazide at 25 milligrams because you end up with too many um, side effects. Of, of low potassium. And you usually, if you have gout, it'll raise the uric acid. 12.5, you usually don't need to add potassium. And if you're on, on a high dose diuretic, you really should be on a potassium pill. You should not be trying to use a whole lot of high sugar potassium, a lot, a lot of bananas and fruit, because all you're gonna do is raise your sugar and your weight. So you don't wanna be on a lot of um, um, high potassium sugary foods in order to keep your potassium normal. And I see that somebody else was on lisinopril HCT. Um, you can use that, but you just need to be aware of the fact that you could end up with a dry cough and watch out for any swelling that you may have um, so you can pick it up early. Um, somebody said they were on metformin, which is the first drug we use for diabetes, it's not for hypertension. And by the way, I just read an article saying that it did help prevent dementia, they thought. Somebody's on amlodipine by itself, which is fine. Um, somebody's on chlorthalidone. Chlorthalidone is a, is a diuretic. It's not used as commonly in this country, but it was the, the diuretic that was used in most trials worldwide. Um, 25 milligrams of chlorthalidone is equivalent to 50 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide. You need to be on potassium with that because that's, that's a drug that you're going to lose a lot of potassium on. Um, and then, um, Oh, and, a, and a couple of people were on metoprolol. Um, now somebody was on tartrate, which has to be taken twice a day, as opposed to succinate for metoprolol. So um, you can ask your doctor if you can switch to once a day. And, um, and furosemide is needed, which means that, and this is an interesting combination here. This person's on a high dose calcium channel blocker, amlodipine, and they take furosemide is needed, which means they're having swelling coming from their amlodipine. So, so you probably need a lower dose of amlodipine if you're having swelling, and you'd have the higher dose of the angiotensin receptor blocker with a diuretic like hydrochlorothiazide and possibly a beta blocker. So we change our medicines based on the side effect profile. So if you're having side effect from a high dose of one pill, you just lower that pill and use a higher dose of something else and add other drugs to it. 
So that's how we basically decide on how we do, um, do our medications. And a number of people are on statins, which is good. They are life-saving. If you have muscle aches or joint pains from a statin, there are eight of them, so you just move to another one. Um, not a problem with that. Just because you have a side effect from one doesn't mean you have a side effect from one of the others. And you also need to recognize that, that um, statin side effects are reversible. So when you hear these things on, on social media, all statin side effects are reversible, all right? You stop the statin, you don't stay on a statin until you're crippled. Some people say, well, I couldn't walk up the stairs. I said, well, you don't stay on a statin until you can't walk up the stairs. As soon as you start having muscle aches or joint pains, you stop the statin and see if it goes away. And if it does, then it's due to the statin. If it doesn't go away, then it's due to some arthritis and other things. But you immediately just stop it and see what happens and you try a different statin. Now, any questions? Yeah, there's some questions. I see that um, Tanya Covington, you had your hand up. Yeah, ask Dr. Davidson, okay. this is Tanya Covington. Um, I am wondering, you mentioned the, um, the heart pounding thing. So I'm having, I'm having a problem with that a couple of times through I'm so forth. Then the reason went down, but I'm on um, A. I'm losing you every second word I'm losing. So, oh, I'm sorry. So the AM notification um, is giving me pounding heart rate. Are you hearing me? What, yes, I'm hearing you. What dosage are you on? Five or 10? 10 for amlodipine and 50 for low start and potassium. So you do if, if, if it's not a beta said, blocker, what should I do? Hold on. You said 50 of low start Yeah, you're, you're, you're breaking up. You might want to turn your camera off and then just talk because it's your bandwidth is, is breaking, breaking up. Is that better? Yes. It, Did yeah. you say 50 milligrams of low sartan? Yes. Okay, well, that's a low dose. So your amlodipine can go down. If you're having side effects of amlodipine, you can go to a lower dose of, of, of the amlodipine and a higher dose of the low sartan. If you okay, don't get 10 milligrams of amlodipine. Right. I said you can go to five milligrams okay. because you're having right. side effects. Increase the low sartan to the maximum dose of 100 unless you okay. have kidney disease and your doctor doesn't want to go to a higher dose. Is that the nope. case? Nope, that's okay. not the case at all. You go, the, you go to the higher dose of low sartan with the hydrochlorothiazide. If that doesn't control you, then a, a beta blocker would have to be added to that. But anytime okay. you have a side effect to a drug, you just lower the dosage and see if the person still has the side effect. Okay, I have an October uh, physical, uh, physical follow-up. So I will mention all this to my primary and thank you very much, Dr. Davidson. Uh, Dr. Davidson, could you address um, what you said a little earlier about the protection offered to your um, organs if you were on medication versus um, not on medication. Okay, somebody asked, do you get damage from, how long does it take to get organ damage from hypertension? And, mm -hmm. and they said, I've been on medicine for 10 years. Well, the medicine is not gonna cause organ damage. It's gonna prevent organ damage, provided that they've controlled the blood pressure. Now, if your blood pressure is running 160 on medicine, then it's not gonna help you. But if you controlled your blood pressure on medication, you're not gonna get organ damage. So if you have an elevated blood pressure with or without medication, you will damage your organs. Okay. You, will, you, will, you will develop atherosclerosis. You will damage your kidneys. You start losing brain cells. So that's another reason why we have so much senile dementia because you lose a lot of brain cells when your blood pressure is elevated. So there's all those kinds of things going on um, when your blood pressure is elevated. And so, um, and so but, but if your blood pressure is controlled on medicine, the medicine itself does not cause damage. It prevents damage. I have a question. Um, you had mentioned something about um, if you are vegan, you cannot get your cholesterol low enough or back in the normal range. I said that... if you have a genetic defect, if you have a genetic defect in your, in your liver, and oh. you know that because the LDL is going to be over 150. Even being a vegan, you will not be able to get it down because it's not coming from your diet. 
your, oh. your liver is filled with enzymes that metabolize your cholesterol each night. If you are devoid of half of your enzymes that do that, your cholesterol is going to be extremely high. And that means you have a genetic defect in your liver. Oh. And you're going to have to have. Now, a statin is an enzyme. It's called an HMG reductase inhibitor. It is an enzyme, the same enzyme that you have in your liver that you don't have enough of. And so you will have to be on medication if you have a genetic defect. So, and I, and I have some vegans who try to become vegans and, and then they still can't get it lower because it, it is not their fault. It is not coming from their diet. It is coming from the, the defect in their liver. Oh, thank you for clearing that up. Thank you. There were a few other questions that came in after um, I sent you the list of questions in advance. Okay. The first one is, do iron supplements affect the heart? In a negative way. Um, there were studies done decades ago um, that showed that people on iron did have an increase in cardiovascular mm -hmm. events. It was a European study, but it was noted. If you are not iron deficient, you should not be on iron. Um, so that, and you need to find that out. Just be, and if you're anemic, um, then that anemia needs to be worked up. If it's an iron deficiency anemia, you first must have a complete GI workup. Um, your doc, your gastroenterologist needs to look at your stomach and look at your colon for blood loss. Um, if you still do not have, uh, if you're still anemic and all of that is negative, then a hematologist needs to evaluate your anemia. Um, when I went to medical school in the South, they told me all black women are anemic, so don't worry about it. Um, so I swore that when I got out of medical school, I would work up all anemia. So that's my pet peeve, is that an anemia I worked up. <laughs> But so I work of all anemias. <laughs> the hematologists love me. So they have to be the last word. But no, you, you shouldn't just randomly take iron. Um, you need to make sure that you're iron deficient in order to do that. But if you are anemic, that needs to have a full workup, first from the gastroenterologist to rule out blood loss, and next from a hematologist to find out why you're anemic. Okay, the next one is a two-part question. What is a heart murmur? And what role does this play in blood pressure health? It doesn't play any role in your blood pressure. Heart murmur is the sound of blood going through your heart. Um, you can do a sonogram called an echocardiogram to look at the heart, a heart, um, the heart, the heart valves to see if they're abnormal. Um, most murmurs are what we call innocent murmurs. It's just the sound of blood going through the heart. So what, what the doctor hears when they're listening through their stethoscope is that swishing sound of the blood going through the heart. That is a murmur. So you should be able to hear it on just about everybody. And there are there we have we have innocent murmurs, which are normal, which is just the normal sound of blood. And we have pathological murmurs, which means that you either have leakage of your heart valve or you have calcium buildup on your heart valve called stenosis. And um, and then of course that has to be treated based on certain criteria when it is appropriate to treat that. And we have many ways that we treat that now, both um, by intervention with catheters and, um, and open heart surgery. So that, but a heart murmur is uh, just the sound of blood going through the heart. And you can very easily find out what it is by, um, by doing a, um, um echocardiogram on your heart. Okay. Dr. Um, Dixon. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted a question on, I um, was uh, diagnosed many, many years ago um, with a micro valve prolapse. And when I would have to go to the dentist, I used to have to take large amounts of amoxicillin. And then later, I guess it was the College of Cardiologists uh, said that we did not have to do that anymore. So I don't have to um, uh, you know, I don't take those large doses anymore, but is the, is the mi mitral valve, if I'm saying prolapse, the same as a heart murmur? Okay. If it was many years ago, you probably don't have mitral valve prolapse. We have changed the criteria for what is mitral valve prolapse based on the echocardiogram. We, there are several views on the echocardiogram and one view you can make everybody have mitral valve prolapse. So years ago, we used to say that all women had palpitations and chest pain. We did an echocardiogram and we did that view, the four chamber view, and we manipulated the probe so that we gave everybody mitral valve prolapse. It turned out that we had 40% of the population in the world having mitral valve prolapse, which is not real. So the, so the echocardiographers association 
redefined the view that we could actually diagnose mitral valve prolapse. So you could no longer diagnose it in that particular view. And so the majority of people do not have mitral valve prolapse in the view that we now have to use. So if you were diagnosed many years ago, um, you will probably do not have it because it is very rare now, now that we've changed the criteria. And that, that's one criteria that's been changed. The second criteria is that we realize that one of the reasons we have MRSA, these, these um, horrible bugs that, that cannot be treated, um, is because we gave everybody antibiotics when they went to the dentist. Mm -hmm. so we no longer can give people antibiotics for mitral valve prolapse. That's across the board. Um, you, there's only certain criteria. One is a um, um, ha having um, a heart valve, actually having a heart valve. Another one is having a history of endocarditis. Um, another one is being a transplant patient. Um, and another one is actually having um, um, artificial, um, um, li not limbs, but art artificial uh, prosthesis. Um, so those are the reasons why we would use um, an antibiotic now. Having a murmur, including mitral valve prolapse, is not a reason for us to use an antibiotic. And the reason we came to that conclusion was that people brush their teeth all day, every day, and they don't end up with endocarditis. So yeah. therefore, we were over-treating the world, and um, we created this whole problem of, of, um, of resistant strains to, um, to bacteria. So, mm -hmm. um, so, that was, so there's two reasons why um, you need to have that re-looked at. So, so, so somebody should re-echo you and see if they have a, um, uh, see if you still have, have mitral valve prolapse by the new criteria. And the reason that's important is that insurance companies up your rates for having mitral valve prolapse because mitral valve prolapse can deteriorate um, into um, worsening leakage and other problems that you may have to have a replaced valve. So um, you wanna make sure that you either have it or you don't have it. Um, and, and then again, even if you do have it, it's not a reason for antibiotics. Um, can I do I'm sorry. Go on. Yeah, I was just uh, at my internist yesterday and she did the basic, you know, she listened to my heart and they did an EKG because I mentioned I'd had some other little interesting uh, issue in the right jaw. It looked like it was coming, you know, radiating and it's something that happens very rarely. So they did and they said everything was fine. So with her just doing that listing and then doing that um, EKG, do I, would I still need to uh, request this echocardiogram? Uh, you're the person who asked about the mitral valve prolapse? Yeah. Okay, that's a totally separate issue. Oh. Mitral, you said that you were diagnosed decades ago. Right. And saying that that was probably before we changed the criteria. Mm -hmm. So that you want that you want the mitral valve to be looked at to see if you still have that diagnosis. That's number one. Now you said that you had you said his jaw pain. Yeah, that was yeah, yeah, last night, but I would I happened to have an appointment with my internist yesterday. Okay. And she when I told her that she had them do an EKG. Okay, EKG doesn't tell us much of anything. Okay. It's a 500 year old test. We still do it. Um, it's, it's important for a couple of things. You could have a conduction defect that may need to have a, um, a pacemaker. Um, it is important when you go to the emergency room with chest pain, because there's a certain heart attack. Remember I told you about the heart attack that totally closes off the artery wall. Right. It, has a, it has a distinctive pattern on it. It's called the ST segment elevated um, heart attack, and that person has to go immediately to the lab and have their artery opened. So the EKG is important when you're arriving at the emergency room so that they can determine whether they need to take you to the lab now or whether they need to just give you aspirin and other things to calm you down and, and do the, the three blood tests that they do of troponins to see if you've had a heart attack, um, where you have the heart attack where the artery is not totally closed. So that one, we don't have to rush so much and we can calm you down and, and do the catheterization later on, okay? So though, that's where your EKG fits in. Um, to rule out coronary artery disease, it cannot do that because unless you've actually had a heart attack, your EKG, it can be normal, it can be abnormal and have a totally normal heart. Okay. We base, our, we base what we do on you on your symptoms. If you are having exertional symptoms of jaw pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, arm pain, chest pain, um, that goes away with rest, 
then, then you need to be worked up for coronary artery disease. If you're having rest pain or when you're lying flat in the bed, which could be acid indigestion, then we don't have to get so upset. Um, more importantly, you have to look at your risk factors. What is your LDL cholesterol? If your LDL cholesterol is over 100, you have coronary artery disease and that needs to be treated aggressively. Um, if you only had one episode of pain, then you may, you know, it's not as big a rush. The tests that I do very frequently on people, um, because especially since most of my patients have risk factors, is a CT angio, is, is a coronary calcium score CT angiogram. It's a special CAT scan, a cardiac CAT scan, which, uh, which is only for the heart. And you can actually do, um, you can actually see if there are, if there, if there, there are um, calcium buildup in the arteries. If they are, then you have coronary artery disease. And that needs to be treated aggressively to get your LDL to under 70 to reverse that. If you have significant um, artery clogging at that point and, and you're having symptoms, um, one of two things can be done, a nuclear stress test or echo stress test. A plain stress test should not be done in women. It's practically valueless because we have abnormal, we have EKGs that were never assessed when EKGs were first evaluated 500 years ago. So we have, we have EKGs that, that don't fit the norm, so it doesn't tell as much. So it needs to be done with a radiological study, like an echocardiogram before and after, and a, um, a, nuclear, a nuclear scan before or after. Um, and, and then if you don't have anything on that, then we wouldn't do anything. If you have something, then you are, are up for a, an angioplasty, a possible, a potential angioplasty. So, but one, one time, and if it's, was, was your jaw pain with exertion or it's sitting at rest? Um, it was at rest. Okay, well then that's not significant, but a, a EKG will not rule in or rule out coronary artery disease. But you mentioned one last point. You mentioned, I do have acid, I have experienced acid reflux. So maybe that was what that was. So keep, keep acid, you know, keep, keep your antacids around and things like that. So you can um, do that, but any exertional symptoms should definitely be studied. And more importantly, look at your risk factors. Yeah. Um, is your A1C, which, which monitors four months of sugars above 5.7? Is your LDL over 100? Um, those are, are issues. Is your blood pressure over 120? Is your body mass index over 25? These are all your risk factors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's what you have to look at. So just because somebody says something's normal, again, your goal is to make sure that you don't develop any significant disease and you're trying to get rid of all of your risk factors and you control those risk factors and people don't understand the role that they play in getting rid of their risk factors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. We've reached the one o'clock hour, actually a little bit over it. Um, you have given us quite a lot to, to learn, um, to, to, to put into practice into our lives. Um, it's kind of a bitter pill, all of this information all at once. But thank you so much. And um, on behalf of everyone who is present and everyone who's a part of the IAWH SMDP Hypertension Con Control Program, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anytime.